Today on Animal Airport, one of the world's rarest birds arrives at the Ark in a last-ditch attempt to save it from extinction. None of us here have seen one, so it will be amazing to see this bird. Two South African guard dogs have the staff reaching for the riot shield, but far from savage, one of them is sick and stuck in transit. You were paid a considerable sum of money to do a job, which you haven't done, so I suggest you get it done. Otherwise, I'm going to hold you responsible for the dogs. <laughs> and Jane and Claude struggle to measure a boxer who's already got the measure of them. <laughs> You're a bit of a leaner, aren't you? With nearly half a million flights a year, Heathrow is the busiest international airport in the world. As well as 65 million human passengers, each year around 40 million animals passing through the airport check in at the Animal Reception Center, affectionately known as the Ark. It's 6 a.m. and the early shift has a far larger than expected number of animal arrivals. I think it's going to be another busy day today. A very busy day. Animal health officer Stuart is on collection and drop-off duty. Um, well, I've just delivered some animals to the warehouse and I've just had a call from base that there's a couple of dogs on a Delta flight that we knew nothing about. Um, so I'm just checking that out and then I've got another pickup to do after that. Dog? 50 pets are already due in yeah. before midday. Pardon? And the numbers are going up all the time. Right, OK. <laughs> South African. She goes, what are you expecting on the South African? I said, two cats and one dog. And then she goes, there might be nine. Nine? Yeah. <laughs> An average day sees 30 cats and dogs passing through the ark. But today, it looks as though there could be more than 200. It's one little cat. A recent change in the rules governing the pet travel scheme means it's much easier for pets to enter the UK. Owners around the world are taking advantage. I'm quite dreading going back to base, to be honest, um, since how busy it is, and probably have dogs and cats everywhere. At the Ark, the kennels are almost full. Anna and Chris are unloading the last two dogs from a flight just in from Johannesburg, South Africa. They're guard dogs and a breed not yet recognised in the UK. The Boer Bull is a mastiff cross, and these dogs come with a health warning. They don't tolerate no fool. Boer Bulls are used by South African farmers to protect their herds from predators. They're headstrong and fiercely territorial. Their owners must use both physical strength and social dominance to prevent the breed's natural protectiveness from turning into aggression. The owner's in the waiting room. Like all dogs, they could bite. Um, obviously, if they're 65, 70 kilos, um, the bite is slightly larger in a Pekingese. They're allegedly guard dogs. It says, I am Kitty. I like people who are calm and sensible and talk to me nicely. Please don't upset me by staring into my cage. If you push that up to a square... Deputy manager Susie isn't taking any chances. It looks like a perfectly nice dog, but they are guard dogs. Um, and it's just slightly risky in this one. What's her name? Kitty. Kitty, come on, babe. Come on, Kitty, good girl. But Kitty seems more of a pussycat. All right, well, we can bring the guy over here to chip with them both. With Kitty them. safely in a kennel, they move on to Bob. He fell ill during a hot eight-hour road trip to the airport. Despite a day's rest in Johannesburg, the 11-hour flight has taken its toll. Oh, gorgeous. Here you go. Good boy. All right, it's steady. I don't, you're going to be able to jump from there. Go on, handsome. Here you go. The staff at the Ark are keen to make Bob as comfortable as possible, so he begins to get over his jet lag. There you go. Good lad. You can pull that round, shall quick. He needs to be cleared through customs as quickly as possible, but every animal must take its turn. Inevitably, there's going to be a wait. 
Animal Health Inspector Sharon is on her way to central London. Her job often takes her away from the Ark to inspect zoos, farms and pet shops. But pigs on the streets of London is a first. Um, we're just popping up to Trafalgar Square. Uh, there are some pigs coming to an event. So we're just popping up to make sure that there's no um, legislation breached and that the welfare of the pigs is fine. Following an outbreak of foot and mouth disease in 2001, the movement around the UK of cows, sheep and pigs is strictly regulated. A campaign highlighting the amount of food people waste has set up a one-day rally in Trafalgar Square. But if these pigs don't have the right papers, Sharon has the power to detain and have them removed. I'm just checking the numbers on their tags. Because to come here today, they had to apply for a permit and they also have to have a tag in their ear with an individual number in it and their herd mark from their origin. And they have it. Each individual ear tag is like the registration plate on a car, allowing its sales history and movements to be traced. The farmer who transported these pigs should be carrying the paperwork that matches their tags. Oh. There you go. Thank you. 47, 48. The, the idea is behind this that should we have an outbreak of foot and mouth tomorrow, we would be able to trace the movement of all livestock within a three day window. The reason it's done is for traceability and disease control. It was the contamination of pig food with meat products that caused the foot and mouth outbreak. But these pigs are being safely fed the waste pulp from the nearby apple press. They're, they're pressing the apples, there's no contamination, there's no meat involved at all. So I don't think there's any risk. These pigs are quite happy and they're always enjoying their apple pulp. Everything's in order and Sharon's job is done. But it's such an unusual sight, she can't resist taking a few piggy pictures. Back at the Ark, Jane and Claude are about to get into a spot of bother with a boxer dog in a bijou box. Yeah, that is too small, isn't it? I know it's only a short flight, but... Come on, Keo. Let's get you out. Come on, in. Come on, in. He's a good boy. Come on, in, Keo. Good jump. Hey, here we go. You hold him for a minute. I'll All just right. measure the box. Oh, Regulations state that the animal uh, must be able to stand up, be able to turn around and lie down, feet out, in a comfortable position. Keo has flown from Larnaca in Cyprus and is clearly excited to be out of the confines of his crate, which is too small for him, so the airline could be prosecuted. <laughs> Jane soon finds that measuring the box is the least of her problems. Right, now comes the fun bit. We've got to measure you! Oh, no! Right, we need to calm. We need to calm. Right, that's that's a good stance, actually, if we can get him. Right, right. I need to get you distracted or I need to look at something. Uh, stay. No, don't sit. What's this over here, What's this? Keo. That's it, just, that's it, that's it. just stand. No. <laughs> stay. Stay. <laughs> Could try the corridor. I need him to sort of sniff at something, but so I can get like a normal. Did he just oh. sniff. sniff at something? Uh... <laughs> You're a bit of a leaner, aren't you? I just, just want to, just want to... Can you, can you, yeah, can you sort of... A dog him? barking at the end of the corridor finally distracts Keo long enough. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, 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 yes. 33. That was good enough. <laughs> go 34, I think. Let's do it as quick as you can. We've done the best measurements we can. Obviously, he's quite an active dog, but there's at least eight out, inches out on the height, which means he can't stand up normally. Um, and the length is borderline, really. If they need to prosecute, then we have to get pictures of the dog standing up against the box, which might be a bit difficult for him because he's a bit of a wriggler. Much of the Ark's time is taken up with the transportation of domestic pets, 
but it also deals with a host of more unusual and endangered animals. From white lion cubs to cheetahs, from Siberian foxes to bamboo lemurs. Well, that's one of the good things about this job. We have the opportunity to see really rare animals and uh, you know, unusual animals. Animal Health Officer Stewart is checking on an endangered tortoise which has just flown in from the United States. The box has travelled the wrong way up, which means the tortoise has right. been on its back for more than eight hours. Stewart's eager to get inside as quickly as possible. Been tipped upside down, which is, uh, obviously isn't great for any animal, even a reptile. It should have upright labels and everything, and livestock stickers, which it hasn't got. So they've probably just presumed it was a bit of freight. Oh, blimey, there's more than one. Not one, but six. six and they're no ordinary tortoises. They're spider tortoises, who get their name from the pattern on their shell, which resembles a spider's web. Pretty good, Nick, actually, that one. They originate in Madagascar, where the wild population has plummeted. Now there's a worldwide ban on their trade. But these have been specially bred in captivity and are heading for a oh, conservation centre in the Not UK. In his 18 years at the Ark, Stewart's never seen a spider tortoise. With all the really rare creatures, he takes some photos for his personal collection. Wherever I am, when I go on holiday with my girlfriend and stuff, I always try and do a bit of bird watching or snake catching if there's anything around. But the animals he's most excited about seeing are yet to arrive. They're one of the world's most endangered bird species, spoon-billed sandpipers. Fifteen years ago, Stuart even travelled to Hong Kong just to photograph them. Uh, I've actually seen them in the wild, but to see them close up here as well, because uh, I'll have to inspect them. So it be, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm even going to bring the camera in and everything. That's how excited I am. At Moscow Zoo, safely in quarantine, a clutch of spoon-billed sandpiper chicks is a waiting collection. Nigel Jarrett from the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust is flying out to pick them up. There have probably never been very many spoonbill sandpipers, perhaps three to 6,000 birds. But over the last decade, they've been declining at a rate of 25, 26% a year. And now there's only a few hundred pairs remaining in the, in the breeding areas. And we're pretty sure that the bird will become extinct in five or six years, unless some of the problems that it's facing on the winter grounds are, are solved. The spoonbill sandpiper breeds in northeast Russia. There are now as few as 120 breeding pairs left in the world. Last summer, Nigel mounted an expedition to Chukotka in Siberia. Braving tough conditions and an ever-present threat from wolves and bears, the team searched an area of 100 square miles to collect eggs in a last-ditch attempt to save the bird from extinction. Egg seven, fur Yeah. Amazing. So precious. 13 chicks successfully hatched. We're in the heart of Moscow Zoo, in the zoo's vet station. The spoonbill sandpipers are kept at the end of this corridor, just around the corner. They've been here 60 days, and now they're ready to do the, the final leg of the journey to, to the UK. It's just a four-hour flight, but because of all the paperwork checks that have to be made, it's going to be something like a 16-hour travel distance for them to do. It's going to be quite a traumatic experience for them and also for us. We've not done this before, so we'll, we'll really just have to keep everything crossed but really it's just something that we've got to hope that you know everything goes to plan as night falls in moscow the chicks leave the zoo but how many of them will survive the flight back in the uk the animal reception center is having one of its busiest days ever They've been over a hundred pets through the door and they're still coming in. Everyone's feeling the heat. The next two guys are absolutely chocker. I think there was more, more dogs and cats on that flight than there were humans. <laughs> Stuart's on yet another pickup, and the number of dogs he's been told to expect continues to grow. <laughs> Oh, is it? We were only expecting one dog, and now we've got three. 
If he'd known, he would have brought the big van. Stuart's almost full to capacity. There's just enough room for the one small dog that's flown in from the US. Ah, uh, just... Ah, oh, shit. This ain't gonna fit. I was told one by Continental. I'm taking the small one in. It's Lily, the pug. Amid the controlled chaos, the owner of the two Burr Bulls is still waiting for customs clearance. He's growing increasingly anxious about the one that's fallen ill. Can you talk to the agent who okay, is at the moment? These guys are blaming him and he's blaming you. The dogs are sitting here. He's been here for six hours. The problem is that I've got a potentially sick dog that could potentially die, you know, in, um, in the kennels out there through stress and everything else. Concerned about Bob the Burble's welfare, the team tries to speed things up. And the priority is the animal at the end of the day, not the paperwork, whoever they might be, whether they're customs, the state vet or anything else. And it's a totally ridiculous situation um, that, you know, a sick dog that we're supposed to have the priority for has now taken six hours to process. Bob the Burble's in safe hands, but that does little to reassure his increasingly frustrated owner. Well, that's not good enough. It needs to be sorted now. I don't care what you do, but you get these dogs out. No, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. You were paid a considerable sum of money to do a job, which you haven't done. So I suggest you get on and get it done. Otherwise, I'm going to hold you responsible for the dogs. Everybody's saying it's everybody else's fault, and the, the poor animals are still there after a 12-hour flight and six hours in the building. If things weren't busy enough, Tuesday is fish day, when the bulk of tropical and exotic fish touch down in the UK. Just had a shipment of over 100,000 fish on 200 log boxes. Once they arrive, it's a race against time to process the thousands of fish and get them to their onward destinations. Any delay could be life-threatening. Towards the end of the shipping time, it's really, really important. Water quality within the bags that the fish are being shipped starts to drop away quite quickly now. So really now, every, every minute for us, we, we feel it's very, very critical. Fish can survive little more than 72 hours in these bags. Nevertheless, they must still be spot-checked before they can be handed over to dealers. And for many, that must take place in a specially lit room. These fish are from, from, from the sea. They're ma marine fish, and they, they, some of them may live very deep in the water. So they are not used to the bright light, and they get stressed and my, and my suffer, my die. On average, 500,000 fish arrive at the Ark each and every week, nearly 28 million fish a year. I know we see more fish than Heathrow sees passengers, so <laughs> it's quite bizarre. We actually, more fish come through this airport than people. So it's, it's a bit bizarre when you think of it like that. Elsewhere, it's business as usual. Doggy business. <laughs> this big yellow bin contains all of the quarantine waste. It does smell a bit, so... Um, there's a company who comes, picks up all the bags, and um, all the bags get incinerated, so... But, yeah, there's awful stuff in these bags. With an average of 25 dogs passing through each day, emptying the bins is one of the worst jobs. Today, it's Chris's turn. I wouldn't like to think about how many dog poos I've picked up while I've been here. Seven years, that's quite a lot. Um, and it's not one of the glamorous jobs, you know, part of her jobs, but it has to be done, unfortunately. At last, some of the customs clearances are coming through and animals are starting to leave. As these guard dogs can be aggressive towards strangers, the owner must collect the animals in person. Foster! Bobby! Come on, mate, let's go. Let's go, Bobby. Let's go, Bobby. Let's go, Bobby. Let's go, Bobby. Come on. Come on. Come on. 
Say goodbye to your friend. Bob is swapping lifeguarding a farm in South Africa for family living in Kent. Here you go. There's Mummy Boo. He's going home. He's going home. Come on. Long journey. It's finally time for the last leg of their marathon journey. At the animal reception center, the day Stuart and the team have been waiting for has finally arrived. After a year of intense planning, 13 endangered spoon-billed sandpipers have touched down on British soil, and a welcoming party from the Wildfowl and Wetland Center has gathered at the Ark. This is one of the rarest birds in the world, an, you know, an iconic rare bird of the Far East. None of us here have seen one, so it will be amazing to see this bird. But more importantly, to, to save the species, we're desperate to get it back to Slimbridge, where we know we have complete control of no, what we want to do, to look after the birds in exactly the way we want. So uh, it will be a big relief. A significant number of the entire world population of spoon-billed sandpipers are now in the UK. Everyone wants to catch a first glimpse. Running around. It's an emotional moment. That's, <laughs> that is something special. And um, yeah, I, you know, as a bird watcher, as a kid who'd been seeing, has known what this bird is like, and now in the last five years when you're really aware of the conservation issues. And they're in Britain. This rare bird is in Britain. Checking them over is a privilege for Stuart. I'm really, I'm really chuffed that they're all alive, actually, to be honest. I mean, it's a bird that small, you never really know. But they are so, looking so well, uh, drinking away, eating, chirping away. Uh, couldn't really ask for anything better, really. The sandpipers are on the verge of extinction due to habitat loss. By bringing these birds to the UK, it's hoped to bring the species back from the brink. Just want to find one of these off first. Nigel's travelled from Russia with the birds, and he's keen to inspect them. Plumage looks tight as well, so... Yeah, very good. Do them all. You can tell that they've eaten food, you can see feces. Yeah. Just that have been eaten, and there's no poo stuck to their feet, which is great. Before they go, another photo opportunity for Stuart. They're all fitting well, they're all on their feet running around, which is a great sign. Four hours is a long time for something that's only about 30 grams in weight to, to be stood in a, a, sh a small, warm space. We're just delighted that, to know that they're all alive and well. The birds are heading to Gloucestershire to a purpose-built quarantine facility. Rather like royalty, they'll travel in not one but two vehicles for their own protection. Yes, yeah, so we'll be carrying the birds back in two, two cars, one box in each car just to cover any eventuality, really. I've got to get back with something. There'll be a sigh of relief when they reach the other end. January 2012 was the busiest month on ARC records. The change in the rules for the pet travel scheme meant they processed a record number of pets. 1,290 dogs, 757 cats, and even the odd rabbit. After an explanation to his owners of the rules about the size of animal flight crates, it was a thrilling reunion for the ever-excitable Keo. And the spoon-billed sandpipers made it safely to Gloucestershire, where Stuart couldn't resist taking a day out for yet more photos.